Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. I'd like to demonstrate the mixing of alginate impression material. Alginate material is one of the finest materials that we have in dentistry and it is what we would consider as an elastic impression material. Alginate is supplied in a powder which is mixed with water and after a short period of time sets to a flexible gel-like material. The powder consists of a soluble sodium alginate and also contains calcium salts which when mixed with water react and form an insoluble calcium alginate gel. The powder is supplied in several packages. One of the common packages is a bulk container much the shape of a coffee can. The second is individual pre-weighed packages uh, packaged in foil to prevent uh, contamination by moisture. The obvious advantages of the pre-weighed packages, of course, are not the requirements for dispensing this material by bulk or by weighing. You simply need to measure the amount of water necessary for each of the individual packages. However, the individual packages are somewhat more expensive than the bulk material, and for this reason, many Dennis, you will use the bulk material rather than the pre-weighed packages. The problem with the bulk material is with dispensing the powder. In general, we do not weigh the powder, but we simply try to measure a volume with a scoop of this type. In order to get reasonable reproduction in the dispensing by volume, we need to aerate the powder in the can. This is done by inverting the can several times before dispensing. Once the powder is aerated, then we can carry out our uh, dispensing. In general, one scoop of the powder is equivalent to one mark on the cylinder supplied by the manufacturer and indicated as a one scoop mix. It's also labeled at two scoops and three scoops. We will be making a three scoop mix and thus have the cylinder essentially filled with water. We'll pour the water into the rubber mixing bowl because we should pour the powder into the liquid in order to minimize the entrapment of air. We'll aerate the bulk sample again. After thoroughly aerating it, we'll remove the, the lid carefully and simply very lightly dispense three cupfuls of the material. We do not want to pack the material, so we go in loosely without pressing it against the side, bring it out, roughly tap it with the spatula to remove major voids, strike it off flush, and then add it to the container of water. We use three of these scoops for this uh, particular mix. We'll start the stopwatch and we will mix for one minute. Initially, we simply are going to try to wet the powder with the water and then once this is completed, we then can continue the mixing. It seems rather stiff at this point, but it will become more fluid as we continue mixing. We will strop this against the side of the mixing bowl rather than trying to whip the material. This will tend to break any bubbles that we would incorporate in it and tend to minimize the entrapment of air. We want to obtain a smooth, creamy consistency, and if we mix too short a time, we will end up with what's called a grainy mix, and this graininess will show up as irregularities in the impression material at the surface. While we have mixed approximately the one minute period, and I want to make some cylindrical samples for further testing. 
So we will fill these little cylinders with alginate. And then we will place inside them an insert And then finally, press the sample down to form a final cylinder. We've reached the time when this material would normally be taken from the mouth. I'd like to give you some indication that although this material is called elastic, it is not perfectly elastic and some permanent deformation of this material can occur. We'll take this small cylinder and place it underneath this pressure foot attached to this dial gauge. And we'll adjust the dial gauge so that it will read zero. Now, we will compress the sample 12% which is 90 thousandths of an inch. And we will hold the sample under compression for 30 seconds. After this time, we will remove the compression, allow 30 seconds for the sample to recover, and then examine how far the sample failed to come back to its initial dimensions. So we will take this off at 40 seconds then. All right, we will take the compression off the sample and I'll simply hold the presser foot up and wait for the 30 seconds to pass, which will bring us uh, at 10 seconds on the, on the dial. Since the dial is uh, upside down, of course, it will uh, read opposite to what you might normally expect. Now, we'll put this down at 30 seconds, and you can see that it fails to come back to zero by about 16 thousandths of an inch. If it had been perfectly elastic, it would have come all the way back to zero. This represents a permanent deformation of the material, something in the range of two and a half percent. So that when this material is used clinically and is compressed by removal over an undercut of something in the order of 12 percent. If the material is held under compression for 30 seconds, it will fail to come back to its original dimensions in the order of two and a half uh, percent. Now we can accomplish the same test now, only using a very much shorter period of time. We'll take another sample, we'll place this at zero again. Now this time we will try to put the 90 thousandths load on just long enough to get the load on and then take it off. So we just put it on and then we'll immediately take it off. Now we'll wait 30 seconds for the sample to recover, which will be nearly 60 seconds on the dial. And we'll see whether we have more nearly approached uh, our original dimensions. This particular material has a property of having different qualities at different rates of load application. This is a little unusual in terms of mechanical properties of materials where we expect to have them the same properties under most conditions. Now you can see we place the dial gauge back on and we are within five thousandths of an inch of the original dimensions, indicating then that these materials, when used to take impressions in the mouth, should be held under compression for the shortest possible period of time. This will give you the most accurate impression that you can obtain. The clinical word for this is that you should remove alginate impressions with what's called a snap removal. This means once you have broken the seal around the periphery of the impression, that the material should be removed with a single stroke 
and you should not hold the material under compression for a long period of time. This can be also demonstrated in another manner and that if we place a sample under this second instrument and simply place this again at zero and then put these two weights on the sample, you of course can see the shortening of the sample, but the interesting thing to see is that the material continues to change dimensions as the weight is on the sample. This means that the material really is flowing while the load is, is on the sample. Unlike a perfectly elastic solid, which would simply reach a minimum value and simply hold it at that particular point. So although we call this material an elastic material, it has what we call plastic properties and it can result in inaccurate impressions. Again, this second test simply reemphasizes the necessity for rapid removal of impression materials. You gain in two areas. You gain in the fact that you get a more accurate impression and that the material behaves as a stronger material the more rapidly it is deformed. Probably one of the weaknesses of alginate impression material is that they do have some tendency to tear, particularly if they have thin sections present in the impression. This can be minimized by increasing the rate of removal of the sample, thus increasing the resistance to tearing and improving the chances of getting a complete impression without any tears in it. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.